Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for being here tonight. We're so excited about this special event with um, William Finnegan and Carissa Moore. Uh, my name is Ruth Fletcher, and I'm the Dean of Professional Programs here at Punahou School. And before the official program starts, I just wanted to give a special thank you to the class of 1950 who is sponsoring this event and is sponsoring our Writer in Residence program with William Finnegan. And he's here for two weeks on our campus and we're just so delighted. So thank you to the class of 1950. Um, Punahou School, as you know, is all about learning and professional programs helps to shape that learning and share it with the community. What's really fun is the science of learning tells us that we all have mirror neurons in our, in our brains, and if we mimic what we see, uh, we improve ourselves. So what I'm hoping tonight is after we uh, watch Carissa Moore on a little video, and after we listen to William Finnegan and um, look at his writing, maybe all of us will improve a little bit. <laughs> so thank you very much to the class of 1950. Please just sit anywhere. Uh, this is open seating. And so now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce um, Mr. Paul Hamamoto, who is the Academy Department Chair and also kind of the catalyst, along with Maureen McLeod, for our writing center that exists in the high school. So thank you, Paul. Thanks for coming, and I would also like to add my thank you to the class of 1950 for their generous support for bringing Bill Finnegan here, um, as well as to professional programs at Punahou, uh, Ruth Fletcher and Renee Chang. Renee, where are you? Uh, they both put in many hours helping to make this evening and his two-week stay here good for our students and our school and the larger community. Uh, and I also have to acknowledge Dr. Maureen McLeod. Maureen, will you stand, please? Yeah. Maureen is the director of the Writing Center this year, and it's really her talent and toil that were the key ingredients in bringing all this to fruition. Um, so thank you to all of the people who've worked to make this, make this evening. Um, we're in for a real treat tonight. Uh, so I'm just going to say a few words of framing and introduction and then get out of the way. Um, we are here to get a peek into the lives of two warm, thoughtful, talented people. Very talented people. Uh, between the two of them, they have three surfing world championships and numerous <laughs> journalism <laughs> awards. Okay. Okay, Carissa's got the surfing crowns, and Bill's got the journalism bling, um, but the reason we are celebrating them together is because of what they really do share. They both love surfing. I don't think either of them can actually imagine their lives without it. They both have an audience, fans and readers, and so they both know that what they do and what they say has real impact in the world. They both seem to have found a way to follow their bliss, which I think a lot of us try to do. And they both know at the heart of the work they do, they strive for beauty and truth. And I guess that simply means that they are both artists. And we have the pleasure of listening to these two artists share their journeys and talk with each other. We will have a moderator for the first part of the evening, and then there will be time uh, for you to ask uh, questions of them. Um, so first, let me introduce our moderator, Tom Gamarino. He teaches English in the academy. He grew up surfing in New Jersey, and he heads off on a sabbatical in the fall to promote his second novel and to start his third. Uh, Tom Gamarino, can you stand? So I will admit that I didn't try too hard to dig up any dirt on Carissa, but I was tempted to because when I asked her former teachers to tell me about her, it was all the same. I quote, one of the most genuine down-to-earth students I've had the pleasure of teaching. She puts in the work and achieves great things. A great role model. 
That smile of hers radiates an inner beauty I can only describe as heartfelt and gracious. She is humble by nature and so willing to be of service. Everybody, it seems, loves Carissa. I actually didn't get to know her when she was a student, but I had lunch with her a few days ago, and it was one of those annoying life moments after you hear all these wonderful things and then you meet someone, and within five minutes you realize it's all true. <laughs> Seriously though, it is such a thrill to have her here. Punahou graduate from 2010 and three-time surfing world champion, Carissa Moore. Every time I paddle out, I'm looking for that perfect wave. When I see the water start to move, I feel it. The rest of the world disappears, all the people out there and all the cheering. I don't hear anything. I don't have anything written. It's all spontaneity. It comes from the heart. It's what I feel. And so when I stand up, it's just creativity just flows from inside. It's, it's really an indescribable feeling. It's fluid and it feels like you're flying. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's one of the best feelings in the world. Surfing's always been a family affair. I mean, my dad was the one who pushed me into my first wave at Waikiki when I was like four or five. And um, my mom at that age was the one who was catching me at the end of the waves. That's how it all started out, was just me and my dad. And he's been a part of the journey from the very beginning. And he's still a part of my journey. At that point, I surfed for Roxy. I think I started competing around Nine, ten. So, uh, I've been doing it for a little while now. <laughs> I put Carissa first on a board when she was probably six months old. So it was sort of the idea from the beginning to, to have her surf, um, or at least share the experience with her. Carissa from like super early had a really good, two things. She was good at translating something visual and then she had a great sense of movement. You don't need to hold my breath, roll, let the wave roll me around, and then relax. <laughs> I love that part. <laughs> okay. When I grew up, there weren't little girls surfing. It, it was just pretty much a guy thing. I think we were a bit of a novelty, and I didn't have anybody to sort of gauge myself off of, like, how do you coach a surfer? For me, it was more of the idea of um, trying to accelerate the process. So I'd go out with her and help her set up in the lineup, push her into waves, which that's, that stuff when you're six, seven years old is really hard. So instead of going out sort of struggling, maybe catching two or three waves in her session, we'd go out and catch 30 or 40 waves in a session. I remember the first time that I heard about Carissa was that she actually had a website and, you know, a few of the older girls on tour were, were looking at it and they were like, you should see this nine-year-old kid. <laughs> She's doing like 360s and, and little fin, fin kind of wops, which are, you know, turns that no one else was doing in competition. And there was a lot of women that started to push themselves 
in the lineup and you know they're watching Carissa and they're like okay if she's doing it she's going to be here really soon and I need to be able to do that to be able to compete against her so everyone knew they had to step it up. One of my favorite spots that I surf, Kiwalo Basin on the South Shore of Oahu. When I first paddled out there when I was about 10 years old with my dad, I actually got yelled at by one of, one of the locals. I remember him saying, hey, you, you don't belong here. Go back to Waikiki. And, um, you know, when I first started out, there weren't many girls in the lineup. And it was definitely tough to earn people's respect, especially in surfing, where a lot of the sport is very male-dominated. The number one thing that my dad has taught me is to never sell yourself short. And you can do anything that you put your heart and mind to. It's going to be a good evening, isn't it? I didn't have to dig for any dirt on Bill Finnegan either, because he published some of it himself in his latest book. So instead, I asked his niece, Lee Johnston, class of 2014, one of my favorite students, to tell me what I should know about Bill. And she wrote this. The way Billy has lived his life following his passions is inspirational to me. I've grown up hearing his stories about chasing waves around the world, from Fiji to Bali to South Africa. The adventures he comes away with make for great stories, and I love hearing about everything from transvestite wrestlers to illegal turtle trading. I also like hearing about the steps he took to reach the success he has today, like his teenage years, digging graves overnight and pumping gas at the gas station to earn money to travel and surf. Thanks, Uncle Billy, for setting such a great example of what it means to find something you love and dedicate your life to it. It is such an honor to have Uncle Billy here former grave digger and gas pumper, former high school English teacher, current staff writer for The New Yorker, lifetime surfer, and recent author of Barbarian Days, A Surfing Life. Please give warm aloha to Bill Finnegan. Thanks very, very much, Paul. And Lee, that was, I was blindsided by that kind of, my wonderful niece, who's in college back east, so we get to see her. I live in New York, and I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I think I'll just read the very beginning of this book, because it needs a little explanation, because it's the beginning, and also because it takes place here in Hawaii, just in Honolulu. And, um, uh, I guess it explains itself. Um, I'll just read a few pages. Um, and, uh, yeah. I had never thought of myself as a sheltered child. Still, Kaimaki Intermediate School was a shock. we just moved to Honolulu. I was in the eighth grade, and most of my new schoolmates were drug addicts, glue sniffers, and hoods or so I wrote to a friend back in Los Angeles. That wasn't true. What was true was that Howleys, white people, I was one of them, were a tiny and unpopular minority at Kaimaki. The natives, as I called them, seemed to dislike us particularly. This was unnerving, because many of the Hawaiians were, for junior high kids, alarmingly large, and the word was that they liked to fight. Asians were the school's biggest ethnic group, though. In those first weeks, I didn't know enough to distinguish between Japanese and Chinese and Korean kids, let alone the stereotypes to which each group viewed the others. Nor did I note the existence of other important, tri important tribes, the Filipinos, the Samoans, the Portuguese, let alone all the kids of mixed ethnic background. I probably even thought the big guy in Woodshop, who immediately took a sadistic interest in me, was Hawaiian. 
He wore shiny black shoes with long, sharp toes, tight pants, and bright flowered shirts. His kinky hair was cut in a pompadour, and he looked like he'd been shaving since birth. <laughs> he rarely spoke, and then only in a pigeon unintelligible to me. He was some kind of junior mobster, clearly years behind his original class, just biding his time till he could drop out. His name was Freitas. I never heard a first name. But he didn't seem to be related to the Freitas clan, a vast family with a number of rambunctious boys at Kamiki Intermediate. The stiletto-toed Freitas studied me frankly for a few days, making me increasingly nervous, and then began to conduct little assaults on my self-possession, softly bumping my elbow, for example, while I concentrated over a saw cut on my half-built shoeshine box. I was too scared to say anything, and he never said a word to me. That seemed to be part of the fun. Then he settled on a crude but ingenious amusement to pass those periods when we had to sit in chairs in the classroom part of the shop. He would sit behind me, and whenever the teacher had his back turned, would hit me on the head with a two-by-four. <laughs> bonk, 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 a nice steady rhythm, <laughs> always with enough of a pause between blows to allow me brief hope that there might not be another. I couldn't understand why the teacher didn't hear all these unauthorized, resonating clonks. They were loud enough to attract the attention of our classmates, who seemed to find Freitas's little ritual fascinating. Inside my head, the blows were, of course, bone-rattling explosions. Freitas used a fairly long board, five or six feet, and he never hit too hard, which allowed him to pound away to his heart's content without leaving marks, and to do it from a certain rarefied, even meditative distance, which added, I imagine, to the fascination of the performance. I wonder if, had some other kid been targeted, I would have been as passive as my classmates were. Probably so. The teacher was off in his own world, world only, worried only about his table saws. I did nothing in my own defense. While I eventually understood that Freitas wasn't, ho wasn't Hawaiian, excuse me, I must have figured I just had to take the abuse. I was, after all, skinny and howly and had no friends. My parents had sent me to Kamiki Intermediate. I later decided, under a misconception, this was 1966 in the California public school system, particularly in the middle class suburbs where we had lived, was among the nation's best. The families we knew never considered private schools for their kids. Hawaii's public schools were another matter. You wouldn't have known that, though, from the elementary school my younger siblings attended. Kevin was nine, Colleen, who is here, was seven, Michael was three. We had rented a house on the edge of a wealthy neighborhood called Kahala, and Kahala Elementary was a well-funded little haven of progressive education. Except for the fact that the children were allowed to go to school barefoot, an astonishing piece of tropical permissiveness, we thought. Kahala Elementary could have been in a genteel precinct of Santa Monica. Tellingly, however, Kahala had no junior high. That was because every family in the area that could possibly manage it sent its kids to the private secondary schools that have for generations educated Honolulu's and much of the rest of Hawaii's middle class, along with its rich folk. I don't know what school I was thinking of. Uh, <laughs> Ignorant of all this, my parents sent me to the nearest junior high up in working class Kaimaki on the backside of Diamond Head Crater, where they assumed I was getting on with the business of the eighth grade, but where in fact I was occupied almost entirely by the rigors of bullies, loneliness, fights, and finding my way after a lifetime of unconscious whiteness in the segregated suburbs of California in a racialized world. Even my classes felt racially construct constructed for academic subjects, students were assigned on the basis of test scores to a group that moved together from teacher to teacher. Nearly all my classmates were Japanese girls. There were no Hawaiians, no Samoans, no Filipinos, and the classes themselves, which were prim and undemanding, bored me in a way that school never had before. Matters weren't helped by the fact that to my classmates, I seemed not to exist socially. And so I passed the class hours slouched in back rows, 
keeping an eye on the trees outside for signs of wind direction and strength, drawing page after page of surfboards and waves. And then it goes on for another 450 pages about surfing, but. <laughs> Sorry to say, I've already blown it. I meant to show you Bill's book while he was reading from it. This is the cover. I'm going to try to start recovering now from, from this mishap. Um, I, I'm incredibly honored to be here. Um, the 12 year old New Jersey surfer in me who, who wanted to be a pro surfer someday, and the adult me who is trying to be a writer, uh, just couldn't be more stoked. Um, but it's not about me, it's about two things it's about surfing and writing. And you might ask, well, what do those have to do with each other? It feels like a bit of a mashup, right? The answer is, I, I'm not sure, and that's part of what we're here to find out. So it seems to me like a fitting place to begin um, might be for our guests to tell us about themselves, and, and in particular to give us a sketch of your lives as they've related to these two activities that may or may not be alike, surfing and writing. Who wants to kick it off? Girls first, or? <laughs> um, well, my video kind of gave a pretty good introduction of yeah. my early life. Yeah. Um, I started surfing really early on. Um, my dad and my mom took me to the beach when I was really little, and in the beginning it was just fun. It was time to spend with my parents, and we were, made sandcastles and tumbled in the, in the waves and just had a good time. And, you know, I started doing competitions. My dad entered me in a Menahuni contest. And um, when I was around 10 or 12, I remember having a conversation with him on the way back from the surf. And he asked me, hey, you know, what do you, what do you want to do with surfing? Where would you like to go? And I remember telling him, I, I want to I be a pro surfer. I want to be the best in the world. He's like, are you sure? Because there's going to be a lot of sacrifice. It's going to be a lot of hard work. There's going to be tears involved. But it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be worth it. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I was like, yes, let's do it. And he's like, all right. So from then on, that's when I really felt like that surfing really became my passion, something I was really enthusiastic about. And um, I started doing more competitions. And I did the QS my junior year and surfed on the CT my first, uh, for the, my, my rookie season, my senior year of high school. <laughs> and um, that first year was really tough. There was a lot of things that I didn't expect. Um, it was hard to be on the road for weeks at a time and miss school and my friends and my family. Um, and I was competing with girls that were older than me and had to adapt to new surf spots and new places. So um, that was really challenging, but I kind of found my groove and I'd had a good run on tour. I won three world titles, which I'm really blessed. And I could do something I love every single day and um, travel the world and meet amazing people like yourself and get to do things like this. And I've had the opportunity to give back and it's just been a, a really fun, blessed, journey and I, I, there's so many people that have been a part of it, I wouldn't be where I am today without them. So mm. That's kind of a brief, like, that, awesome. sorry, I didn't know where to go with that. And you got the title in there, you used the word journey, perfect. Mm. Mm. Billy, you want to tell us about yourself? Um, I'm just, um, I have to say first that I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Carissa and of surfing. Um, I've been aware of her since you were really young. I mean, these videos started to surface, mm. you know, when you were about 10 or 12. And um, uh, and she's just got better and better, and I've sort of each time you sort of add a new like incredible maneuver to your repertoire, I'm, I seem to be aware of it. And, um, so when I think about my surfing, it seems negligible. I mean, I've, I've really it, I've never really competed, um, and um, was very passionate about it from uh, when I was a kid. I started. A little later, not you know, like six months, but <laughs> maybe ten, and um, and then luckily we moved here um, when I'd been surfing for a couple of years and, and was really into it. And suddenly, you know, the horizon sort of widened, and 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 these guys I became friends with surfing on Diamond Head Cliffs were um, um, really good Hawaiian surfers. You know, a whole different style, and and, and the waves were more exciting, bigger. Um, 
more powerful, and and it sort of opened out. And and I have stuck with it, low these you know 50 years, um, through um, many different phases of life. And um, I'm primarily, I don't know if anyone mentioned this, um, uh, a political journalist, and um, that's how I make my living. I'm at the New Yorker. You heard and. Um, and surfing was sort of this other side of my life all along, um, which I was a little embarrassed about um, for a long time. Um, sort of kept in the closet. Um, uh, and when it came to actually publishing something about surfing that I'd kind of backed into, I hadn't really planned, but got an assignment from the New Yorker to do it, I was, I was nervous about publishing it because I thought that I wouldn't, you know, suddenly people would say, what? Um, you know, you're just a dumb surfer. We don't have to take you seriously. You know, in these kind of policy debates I'd found myself in. I didn't want to come out of the closet as a surfer. Um, and, and that didn't happen, actually. I mean, I published some big piece. Nobody ever said anything like that. But, um, and then at a certain point, uh, my other books are much more journalistic. Um, I, I kind of, again, backed into writing this memoir. It took me uh, 15, 20 years um, to write. And um, it, uh, it's trying to account for this ridiculous amount of time I've spent chasing waves, um, not to become a world champion or pursue any particular goal, just to, out of the wanting to do it. And, um, uh, you know, with not a uh, level of talent that, that made uh, world championships even an issue. Um, and, um, and yet it's this sort of world that Chris knows all about, and probably some of you do too, um, that I live in to this day and, and, uh, and kind of illuminates. It, it sort of parallels the, 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 the life on land I live and the public life I live to some extent. And, 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 and there's all this sort of surf imagery. I mean, in Hawaii, you're aware of it in a different way, but it's sort of everywhere, everywhere, everywhere now in advertising and pop culture and, and with no sense of what it actually is, of what the thing we actually do is, what, it, what, it, what we're doing in the water and, and what, it, what it feels like and what the subculture is and, and how um, addictive it is. And I'm constantly, this wouldn't happen here, but, but in Manhattan where I live, um, I'm frequently, people say, oh, you're the surfer, and oh, um, oh I'm, I'm thinking of taking up surfing. Yeah. You know, some <laughs> guy in his 50s, the, the cocktail party, we, we, uh, my, my wife and I learned surfing last summer in Costa Rica, you know, in a week in a surf school or something. That, uh, fine, you know, fun, but no, that's not true. <laughs> you, you know, those of us who put, you know, half our lives into it and, and, and however good we get, we, nonetheless, we do it in a serious way. It's a, it's a whole, it's a world of study, you know, and, and it's not, uh, I don't mean to make, you know, some big deal out of it, but I really wanted to write about it and, 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 um, and open it out um, to, uh, a, but this book is really written for the general reader, not for um, surfers at all. Um, who know a lot of what it is, although it's of interest to surfers because it's a lot of places that, that I've surfed and, and, and traveled to earlier in, in my life when, when they were less known. It, some of that's of interest, but um, writing is what I do for a living, to answer the other half of your question. Um, and um, I have kind of always done and, and, and was doing even when I was in high school and was encouraged to do, but kind of never um, gained any traction in the real world. That is to say, I wasn't publishing. Um, until I turned from fiction, which is, I wrote three unpublished novels, and, and then at a certain point, um, I was, I had a job teaching high school, as Paul mentioned, that really um, kind of locked me into politics. I was in, in South Africa in a, in a black high, high school outside Cape Town, very, very political time, and, and I just turned into a political journalist, I and mean, that was what interested me, and then I started actually making a living by writing. And, and uh, started this other life, which continues. Thank you. So I just asked these two for the story of their lives, right? As, as an English teacher and a writer, I'm really interested in stories. Um, any of you could tell the story of your life, right? You'd come up with some kind of narrative, and you'd do it on the fly. Um, presumably, if I were to ask you for the story of the last year or so, you could give me that. If I were to ask the story of this week, 
maybe since you got here, Bill. I could ask you the story of yesterday. What I'm really wondering is, does the, I wonder if this question will even make sense to you. Can you zoom in on one wave? Could you tell us the story of what a wave is like for you? Who wants to kick this one off? It's, at, I will grab it because um, I've just spent a, you know, 20 years trying to describe surfing uh, <laughs> to make it into a story. When it really, huh? Carissa did describe it in that documentary as indescribable, I think, so I may be asking you to do the impossible. Uh, well, it, it, we, we were making this um, podcast this week, and um, uh, the kind of connected to this book and, and what I do, or, or this, maybe the Hawaii part of this book. Um, this is for audible.com. Um, and uh, at one point, my the podcast makers, producers here, Michael and Amy, um, had me mic'd, oops, just like this, um, and uh, on a rash guard out surfing, and they said, when you get a wave, t you know, narrate it, talk us through it. And, and I kept forgetting to do that, and I'd be, we were out at Diamond Head Cliffs kind of for old time's sake, it's in the book. Um, waves were tiny, but it was you know, crowded and pretty. And, and I kept forgetting, and, and, but I'd, I'd be right, oh, narrate, uh, cliffs. I mean, I couldn't think of anything to say, I'm busy. Um, and, and then finally on my last wave, I said, I'm gonna narrate, it was the last wave, it was kind of windy and late, and a, good, a nice little wave. And I took off and said, all right, nice, oh, nice. Nice, and, I'm, and, <laughs> kind of, and, and I ride, and I ride, and I'm, I'm, I'm paid to be eloquent, right? And I get to the end, and I find, ah, I make the last maneuver, nice! And that's the only word I used in the whole narration. I don't know if you guys picked it up or not. It was just, that was it, nice, 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 nice. Ooh, nice. Um, so I was thinking about this very question, whether a wave is a story, and it, at least for me, and I think it might be different for you, um, it, it, you're, you're busy with this maneuver, doing this thing right, ooh, rail kind of bogged, next one, make it not bog, and, and, and what's that section gonna do? And it's just this, it's almost disjointed, unless you are really surfing well, really in command, really have a sense of what the wave's gonna do. I know this wave, I know further down at all, it's like a big picture you're already seeing. That's rare with me, if ever. It's much more like maneuver to maneuver. But if I then have to tell the story afterward to somebody, I can make it more of a narrative. And if I watch you surf a wave, I can really, there's a beginning, a middle, and end. It, it's a story of a certain, maybe it ends badly in a wipeout or whatever, but it, it's like narrative when you're doing it and I'm watching. That's the objective, but the subjective thing is not like that at all. But maybe it is for you. I know we want to know what Carissa yeah. <laughs> experiences as she surfs. That's well, like I think it's a mixture of two. Like when I'm free surfing and the waves are good and it's yeah. a perfect day, there's no thinking involved whatsoever. It's uh, just pure fun, pure enjoyment. Yeah. It's intuitive. It's spontaneous. Um, it's you know, I it just comes and flows from my heart. Mm -hmm. But then there's that other side of it, the competitive side mm -hmm. of it, where you're surfing for judges. You have to yeah. put together a performance, so you are thinking about where you take off on a wave. Yeah. And the first maneuver has to be good, and the second maneuver, and there has to be great transitions, and you have to have a strong finish. Yeah. You know, so there is there is a lot of thinking and strategy involved there. Yeah. So um, I think there's a mixture of both. And you're, you are posing a little story, hopefully a 10-point story. Yes, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you watch contests, surfing, there's often a, they'll go for this thing at the end, which you wouldn't probably do free surfing. Like, oh, it's shallow. It's like, why? No, no, no. Let's just pull out and not do some insane thing at the end. Is that true? No, definitely. I mean, when I'm free surfing, sometimes I'll see a bad little crumbly section at the end of the yeah. wave, and I'll just cut out and look for the next yeah. perfect wave in the lineup. Yeah. But yeah. In a heat, you have to finish it clean and, and yes. leave it with a good mark, something that will, yeah. something strong to leave the judges with. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's not hard to make a narrative out of your rides because they are it's composed. And at some point, we were talking about planning to do this. Um, you know, well, what about the work? Well, maybe we'll show a video. And I just thought, really, your surfing is it's like the work, it, it should be on a wall. <laughs> the work. Thank you. It's, it's <laughs> so, too kind. if you guys are interested and don't know her work, um, I highly recommend a 
Google this video from just a few, a couple months ago at the most, December, that contest at Honolulu, this, where she won the world championship that day and won the event, the, like the final, against a, um, another woman, Sally Fitzgibbon, who also was absolutely ripping. I but may the, have a single frame. Oh. I don't know, is this? Is this it's really, it's really like? beautiful <laughs> video. Yeah, that day. Yeah? It was a very special day, oh. yeah. <laughs> just two people in the water at that spot. Yeah. That place is ridiculously crowded, as you know. Yeah. Did you write about it in? I did. I, I actually dropped out of college to surf that wave. Um, <laughs> and um, I mean, I sort of went there on spring break in my freshman year and thought, oh my, and got it, just two of us. It, this is like before surf forecasting. It, we were just camping out there, and so we got it good, two of us. And I said, that's it. And I dropped out of college and moved <laughs> to Maui and just sat on that wave and lived for that wave for a while. Um, and then, but that's, one never gets it alone anymore, unless one happens to be in a pro contest. Yes, very lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nervous about this next question I'm going to ask you. I'm, I'm, I'm searching my mind for the most innocuous, inoffensive way. Um, but there's this cliche of the soul surfer versus, I think the competitive surfer maybe is that binary. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to stereotype you, but if I were to, I would say that maybe we have a soul surfer here, and we have a competitive pro. Disabuse me of my simplicity, <laughs> if that's the case. Well, when I think of a, just a competitive surfer, I don't know, I think of someone, someone who just does it for the fame and the accolades and the money. Mm. Um, I do it because I love it. I love getting in the water every day. I love spending time with my family and my friends. I love traveling the world. I love the experiences that surfing has opened up for me through it. Um, yeah, I just, I love riding a wave. And, and secretly is that it's just, I like winning, so I guess I, I am a competitive surfer in that way, but um, I just, I purely, I love it. And I think that's when the best surfing happens. I think with anything in life, when you absolutely love it, um, that's when the beautiful, magical stuff happens, so. Carissa manages to combine those things because I, I think, not that I've watched, I'm not so sad that I've watched every heat of your life, but um, I am a bit of a fanboy. I have been keeping an eye on her for years. And, and when you surf, you can you really see the joy in your surfing. Like, besides the stress of competition and what's at stake, you really look like you're having fun. I mean, you, it, it's, it's there in the line. It's there in the in the gesture, in the maneuver. And um, on my side, I um, never stood to make a dime from surfing, but um, although people have accused me of cashing in here and, and you know, I complain, we all complain right, that- Take it back, you're no soul surfer. Yes. Um, and, and I complain and we all complain about crowds, but I get, get sort of on my high horse near the end, you know, hoping that, please, God, can surfing become like rollerblading, just become uncool. Everybody go away, <laughs> you know, leave us alone. Um, and, um, and yeah, and then I don't know if I'm, although plenty of people who've read this have said, that's why I don't surf. I'm so glad I don't surf. Because uh, you get a full sense of all the ways you can get hurt and, and just all the crummy days and all the time that you don't find ways. And that it's not this, this and, and the kind of, things people go through when they surf. And if you watch people surf, you smile when you surf. If I surfed like you, I'd smile too. Um, <laughs> but, but lots of people, you know, you watch them as they're surfing past you, they're not smiling. They've got, they're going through some therapy, you know, arr, arr, and mad at themselves and mad at the world and mad at who's in front of them and, or whatever it is, or just pain of some kind. They're working out as they surf. And so the surfing's got all these other sort of and, but on the competitive side, I mean, I, I, there's nothing I love better than surfing better than my friends. So I, <laughs> I There is that. Huh? There is that. Yeah. Um, regardless of whether you're a soul surfer or a competitor, shredder, somewhere in between, whatever it is, I think every surfer wants to do that. Most of us don't ever get to. Yep. For me, I tell my friends I get barreled if a little water hit the back of my knee. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of us in this room will never be in that uh, blue room. Can you tell us what that experience, surfers ge generally talk about this, I find maybe in your book though a little bit, mm -hmm. kind of quasi-religious language, almost mm -hmm. mystical language about that cathedral inside a wave. Can you tell us what, what that's like? 
You know more about it than I do. Oh, oh gosh. <laughs> well, I probably won't describe it as beautifully as you, yeah. but um, it is really hard to describe the feeling of being in the barrel. Um, it, it's if if for every surfer, it's the best feeling. If if you could just get barreled all the time, like you'd be happy for the rest of your life. Um, usually. When a wave barrels, it's the most powerful, critical part of a wave. And so when you're in the middle of it, it's as if time stands still, and it's almost as if you're like equal with Mother Nature, which is kind of a crazy feeling just because Mother Nature is so powerful and, mm -hmm. and big. And so for a second, just feeling that power surround you and being in the center of it and being untouched, I think that's what's... I don't know. I love that. That's, like a, that's a bigger barrel, not a tiny one. <laughs> isn't, it, isn't it that you're thinking of a kind of... Yeah, Solid like a barrel. One. Yeah, yeah. More like um, that than yeah. some of what you see. Yeah. Because yeah. they're quite different. Perfect. It's never, uh, I'm in the barrel. Again. It might be for some people who get in there a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't know. In my experience, it, 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 um, it's everything Carissa says exactly, but it's also um, like I've had a few places where I, like when I lived on Maui that year I went to surf Honolulu. Before Honolulu started breaking, I was living in Lahaina Town with south swell season. And there was a little wave there at Lahaina Harbor that had an end section that was just like this guaranteed little barrel. Once you got it wired, you could backdoor it, as we say, and, and kind of get in there. Usually kind of small, but I mean, to the point where even at my level, I could get six or seven full barrels every morning, it seemed like there. And it, and it was sort of a matter of like knowing that little chunk of reef. And it became quite safe. A small wave, too. But um, a lot of people talk about the barrel as if it's, ah, but actually the barrel is scary often. I mean, it's almost always shallow for a start. Mm -hmm. it's, and it's committing. You pull in as opposed to kind of go around it. Um, it's a whole thing. People talk about it very casually if it's, ah, oh, yeah, I got barrel. But in fact, in the moment out in the water, it's usually somebody taking a chance. Um, you get hurt. You hit the bottom. You you wipe out hard. Um, I mean, the barrel's got a lot of adrenaline attached to it. Yeah, I think, you know, in the surfing world, like, mm. to look casual in the barrel is, mm. like, the epitome of, yeah. like, of surfing. You've mastered it if you can look yeah. casual. So, yeah. John John Florence, for example, he's, he looks so calm and collected in this hectic, you know, in this hectic um, arena. So, um, yeah. <laughs> and it's, and he's the inevitable example right now. And um, this, this kid, some of you may have heard of, um, lives on the North Shore. Uh, well, you laugh, but I could say that in New York, and everyone would say no, I never heard of him. Um, and uh, and it's, it's his body language. He, just the fact he will drop his hands at a given point. When your hands just, they have to go up. It's just for balance, for just, any, it's just a moment when, I mean, just huge barrels we're talking about, and his hands are down. Mm -hmm. And he's sort of standing straight up as if he's like leaning against that he makes pillar it look over so there. So easy. Yeah, you just. It's like it's like time must have really slowed down for him because everything's happening very fast. But he looks like he's you know, <laughs> standing on the corner. It's it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And and then that issue of if you happen to get this great thing, this get a good barrel, whether to claim it as you come out, how to you know carry yourself, um, and some you know that thing for the judges particularly, um, is, um, happens a lot. And, and yet the coolest thing, of course, is to... Not claiming it all. Act like you've <laughs> been there before. How do you crack a smile, right? Yeah, well, maybe. Do you see, actually, somebody like John John, after a great barrel, will sometimes sort of drop his head, just as if, like, he's in church or something, just kind of... I, I can't believe that. Just I have to think about that. It's sort of the message, and you, that is, that's a, a sort of pinnacle of performance. I have, I have to think about this. Excuse me, <laughs> as opposed to claim it. That is a pretty good segue to my next question, which speaks for itself. There should be a fifth box here for other. Check all that apply. <laughs> Go, Carissa, you have thoughts about, Bill described your surfing as art a moment ago. He, he talks about um, videos of you as works, as in works that would hang on a museum wall. Do you ever <laughs> think of surfing as an art? Um, I do. I think, I think surf surfers are artists. I think that when you stand up on a wave, it's a blank canvas. 
um, and everyone has their own way or their own thing that they want to paint. So I guess I see myself as an artist, sort of. <laughs> um, Shall we go through them? And obviously <laughs> a sport, in, yeah. although that one, I mean, as I say, obviously in your life, in your career, it's, it's proper sport. But for most surfers, that part, this may be out of view for you a little bit because um, of the world you're in and where you're working. But 90-some um, percent of surfers never compete. Mm -hmm. yeah? I mean, a higher percentage probably compete as kids in Hawaii. It was kind of a thing even when I was a kid here in the 60s. Um, but most of the world contests are a distant thing that happens somewhere. And you never see one. Really, you, like, you never see one. There's, there's some, they're held in some other part of Scotland, you know, not where you live. And, and, and so the sport thing is, it's not like organized sports. It's getting more so. There's more organization. But like when I was a kid, surfers, not in Hawaii, so one of the great things about sort of coming here as a kid was that it, it, surfing in Hawaii was not oppositional in the way that it was on the East Coast and on the West Coast and plenty of other places where it started up in Australia and wherever, um, where the, the cops hated you, chased you around, arrested you. Some towns actually banned surfing. Um, it was a sort of juvenile delinquent thing to do. It was oppositional in that sense. And it was not true here. I mean, I got a sense and now understand better, even as a kid, that it was oppositional in Hawaii in the sense that it represented some like Hawaiian opposition to mm -hmm. colonization. I mean, people are probably familiar with the famous kind of um, demonization of surfing by some of the early missionaries, famous Hiram Bingham quote about degradation and barbarism, the story, the title of my book partly comes from that reference, um, as represented by surfing. We've got to get them to stop doing this and nearly succeeded, right? I mean, there were just a handful of surfers at the turn of the 20th century, Dukanamoku et al., but I mean, very, very few people. And, and, and then it, it, it sort of came back, but it felt when I moved here, and I think this is right, oppositional perhaps to like Calvinist business values. No, we're gonna actually have some fun. We're not just gonna you know, work on the cane plantation. Um, but, but, it, but it wasn't, it was really part of the place. And, and you weren't weird if you surfed, and, and the cops weren't going to bother you if you surfed. It was, the cops might surf, and it was fine. <laughs> I wonder if these other two terms make any sense to you guys. I think they, I took them all from your book, actually, Bill, somewhere or other. Yeah. It's not you. It wasn't you calling it a religion. It was someone else in your book. Yeah, and the path also was someone else oh. who, was, who was sort of haranguing me mm. to surf more. I and mean, I thought I already surfed too much. And, and I hooked up with this guy in San Francisco, who was a big wave surfer, he was trying to get me into bigger waves, and was just a really fanatical surfer. And I wanted to keep it more, you know, yeah, it's this thing I do, but I don't really want to talk about it. It's not central to how I understand myself. Okay. Yes, it is, yes, it is. And it, you're on the surfer's path or you're not. Oh, come on, give me a break. I mean, I was like trying to get started as a writer. So there was this debate, and that's where that came up. I don't know, what do you think about all that stuff? Um. Well, I, it definitely is a path and a lifestyle I've chosen, mm -hmm. um, but it's not, I don't like live and breathe and die by it, you know? I definitely, I find balance between it. You know, I mm -hmm. go to the ocean and I have fun and I mm -hmm. soak it in and I, 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 I surf my heart out, but then I also take time to do other things, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's not, it, it, it definitely consumes a lot of my heart and my mind, but it's, it's not everything. But it's also your job. Yeah. I mean, it's how you make a living. So mm -hmm. it, there it kind of comes together to make sense. Yes. Um, he meant it in, this, in this, this, this fellow I'm talking about who was a very smart guy, who was a doctor. He had a successful career. But he, he was, it was this kind of mystical thing. You're either on the path or you're not, man, sort of thing, which was really annoying. Um, Sounds a little and, hardcore. Yeah, he's <laughs> a very hardcore guy. And whereas with you, these things come together. It's not like you have a a career over here you're trying to get going, and meanwhile you're trying to surf, you're able to do both at once. Yes, I'm very yeah. lucky. <laughs> yeah. And the religious part, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I don't know. That one's... I think, I think actually to some, I mean, in some way it's actually a religion to me in the fact mm. that in the ocean and surfing provides a lot of peace for me, just like a church would to some people. And after a long, hard day, you know, you can go there and you know, let things go and... Um, a long, hard day on land. On land, yes. Yeah. Go into the ocean and that's your 
that's your place to find peace, I guess. Mm. You know, I don't know. No, I can certainly relate to that. So I have been stalking Carissa for a few days in preparation for this. That is uh, online. I'm looking at Instagram photos and such. And I came across this one. Carissa, I hope this is OK. I didn't get your pre-approval to put this up here. It's totally fine. Um, <laughs> Must-haves for the next month on tour. Let's do this. And there are, what, 10 things there. And pretty close to the middle is a journal and a pen. And mm. so I wondered, um, what do you what do you write in there? I, you don't have to tell us everything, but do you do you keep a regular surfing journal? I do. Um, I love journaling. I've journaled since I was really young, and I think there's something really beautiful about putting a pen to paper. It's tangible. Um, for me, I use my journal to kind of sort through my thoughts. A lot of my journals are negative, <laughs> but it really helps me. Um, you know, work through my self-doubt and my negative thoughts and get me to a really positive place. So that's kind of what I use my journal for. Um, I the dark side. I was looking for your dark side and I found it. I have a dark <laughs> side. <laughs> uh, Paul said when he was introducing you, everybody loves um, Carissa. And I, 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 I love you too. But I, <laughs> I, I wonder if that's ever like oppressive. Like do you ever feel like, oh, I have to be cheery because everybody thinks that's who I am all the time. Um, I definitely feel like I definitely want to put, be a positive role model and I want to put out a positive image. Um, but I also realize like I'm human. I'm like everybody else and I have my bad days and I get frustrated and I get angry and I can be mean and um, I'm just like everybody else. So I think um, maybe we'll talk about it later, but I, uh, <laughs> okay, I, I, no, I, I have a blog, and for me, that's kind of like my portal to kind of be open with everybody and just be like, hey, I, I have issues, you know, body image issues, and I do struggle with losing, and I do have family stuff that's really difficult sometimes, but it's okay, you know, and for me, it's, it's really helped me to not worry so much about what other people think and kind of let go. And it's really helped me to grow. So the writings helped me grow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, you, you, you spent thousands of hours practicing surfing. You got really good at that, really good at that. And now you're thrust into a position where you have to be more than just a surfer, right? You're, you're a role model for young girls in particular, I would think. Um, well, and, you you. Write, well, and you write for, I mean, like on your blog, you'll write stuff. And you've got a big audience. A lot of people are following you. Yeah, it can definitely be scary at times because you don't know how you'll be perceived. Mm -hmm. um, but so far, it's, I've had a lot of really positive feedback from just being open and honest. And um, that's helped me through a lot of things, challenging times as well. Um, I think one of the things that actually really motivates me is that through surfing, I have gotten a platform to reach more people. And ultimately, that's my goal, is to leave a positive impact. So I'm, I'm really blessed that I've been you know, given that platform. Yeah. So. Bill talks in his book about um, uh, the web editor at The New Yorker suggested he keep a blog about surf spots around New York. And all of his friends put the kibosh on that immediately. No, no, no. But then when Bill went back to them and said, well, what if I do a book, mm. that was OK. Because somehow yeah. a book is less threatening, yeah. less present tense, I think you say. Yeah. That was, that was a surprise. The, the, um, this blog idea, which went nowhere, um, was because I have this um, habit of when the surf is good, deserting my post and missing my deadlines. Um, and um, a surf, the surf gets quite good around New York, um, and uh, especially in the winter, and, and so you have to kind of keep an eye on it, and whenever it's good, go. And um, so this editor who was fed up with my performance said, Where, why are you, you know, and I said, well, I was surfing, and he um, said, oh, and they got this idea that I could do a blog, this was a few years ago when, um, they were kind of going wild on the website um, with blogs of different types because they thought this would be interesting. Nobody knows anything about this. And I thought, yeah, it'd be easy. I could just kind of write it on the car and in the car on the way home and, and you know, adventures of the day and 
characters encountered, you know, frustrations, and make money, and um, this this will work. And but I asked the guys I served with in New York, and they, as Tom said, said absolutely not. Um, and you know, like giving our secrets away, that everybody would know where we surf, and it would get crowded. I mean, I don't know what they were. It was just the answer was no. I wasn't allowed to do it. Um, and and then I was very surprised because I was deep into this book by that point, and I was kind of wondering if there should be a New York chapter near the end. And so I sort of tentatively floated that, and, and they all said, fine. And it was, it was like it wasn't betraying our privacy somehow to be in, on shelves or in the library or on audible.com. It, um, it was just the, the, that present tense, that immediate thing where people could say, oh, today they went to this spot you know, and, and kind of know our oh, places. Right, right. Surfing's all this, you know, secret knowledge and where to go when and. and it's so funny because I'll post a photo on Instagram or something. And don't I'll, tell where it I, is. I'll know when to leave out yeah. the spot because yeah. I'll get hassled for it. And don't even have any land in the photo because you don't want to give any of your little secrets away. Chris, do you have any desire to write something else, a book maybe? <laughs> Well, I'm, I gotta be honest, I am not a very skilled writer. I mean, I love writing, but I... That's not true, you're very clear, and that's yeah. the first thing. Well, thank you. And you're doing, you have this big audience, you better be clear. I, I hope I can get better, I still, I mean, I, my grammar sucks, I still send my, my grandma, my blog post to proofread before I post ah, them. <laughs> so maybe that's why you it copy sounds it. so good. Grandma yeah. loves Hemingway. Um, Carissa did write a book when she was in 12th grade. She gave me permission. To put up her cap seeds project. Um, I, I'm really taken with this title, um, School or Surf. That must have been very much on your mind <laughs> in high school, right? I don't even I know, know, know what the book about. is about. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, it's very cute. Anyway, Chris did not did you write that in 12th grade. It was I think I wrote it, yes. Grade. I think you wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> it was in that phase, which is somehow it just disappeared. Clouded. Wow. Um, but you know, uh, the few pro surfers I know or have known when they were young, and you know a lot more. Lots of them don't finish school. Um, I mean, they're homeschooling, which may or may not amount to anything. Um, true. Yeah. I mean, I know you don't want to diss your fellow <laughs> pros, but. I mean, it's a real conflict, as with tennis and some other things. But surfing starts young. You're tra I mean, if you're sort of shooting for the top, you're soon on the road, really, really hard. I mean, it's amazing you managed to be on the tour and graduate from here. Well, thank you. I mean, it's been an issue I've actually been thinking about a lot lately, just right. because um, I've, I've realized that a lot more kids are homeschooling because they feel like they need to dedicate 100% of their time to surfing in order to have a career in it. And, mm -hmm. The truth is, you don't. Like, I actually feel like balancing school and surfing really gave me an appreciation for the time that I had in the water. And I actually worked even harder. And it mm -hmm. taught me so much about organizing and mm -hmm. staying on top of things and communicating with teachers. And I have to admit, I was really lucky that I went to a school like Punho where the teachers were willing to accommodate my schedule and, and help me stay up with, you know, mm -hmm. keep up with schoolwork and, and stuff when I missed. And, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's really important to have that balance. Mm -hmm. And I think it's possible to do both. And I think, you know, who knows what's going to happen with this path. And it's great to have a backup plan. Mm -hmm. So um, no matter what, you know, something may happen to me tomorrow. And I have a high school education. So <laughs> that's nice. Yep. Um, I want to ask you guys one more question before we turn it over to the audience and take some questions. Because I suspect there must be a few or many. Um, both of you obviously uh, embraced your passions early and followed them as far as you, you could, right? And, and you parlayed them into very successful careers in your respective disciplines. Um, and I know there must be some young people in the audience. Are there? A couple. Well, I, I thought there might be some young people in the audience. Uh, with some really big dreams, I was one of them once. Um, and. Uh, <laughs> And they've got these really big dreams uh, that the world, whatever that means, the adult world, keeps assuring them are impractical. Um, I wonder what you would say to those kids. If you listen to that, your father's voice, <laughs> uh, that's, that's my own case. What do you want to be, son? An artist. What do you really want to be? <laughs> An artist. Yeah, but what are you actually going to be? An artist. 
Um, so do you listen to that voice of practicality, or, or do you trust something in your gut that says you, you can do this, or do you negotiate these in some way? What do you think? Well, I believe that you can do anything you put your heart and mind to. And I believe that every kid should dream big and chase their dreams. And it's possible. I mean, any dream is possible with a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of, a lot of passion, a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice. Um, and it's, you know, I was lucky enough that I had a, I wouldn't be where I am today without a, an amazing support crew, my family, my, my parents especially. So in, in, you know, right there, I would say to the parents, like, I mean, I look at my dad and my mom, and for, I, I think as a parent, what you'd want for your kid is just to see them happy and see them accomplish things in life. So to the parents, I'm like, why wouldn't you want to support them 100%? So... I don't know that if that was even, it was kind of jumbled all over the place. Well, I think you've just, been <laughs> blessed in this regard. You yes, really, really definitely have. Blessed. And the answer for many parents is, I'm not going to support him because he's not going to make a living doing that, whatever it may be. Certainly, if it's surfing. I mean, it, how many, right. very few people manage to do it. Um, and writing, too, is, is a real um, crapshoot, you know. And um, <laughs> what's funny about that? Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and I didn't start making, any, making a living from writing until I was in my late 20s at, at the soonest. Um, and, um, and my parents were actually amazingly um, supportive and easy about these sort of years in the wilderness when I was still, you know, bartending and digging ditches. And, and I'd, um, you know, gone to college and everything, but I, I immediately got jobs for which I had to apply by denying I'd been to college. Um, so I, I wasn't really following a conventional career path. And, and I just saw myself as a, as a novelist in those days. And everything was for that. And, uh, and my journals, speaking of journals, which I relied on or, or wished were much better, because they were the maiden source for this book, but were, like maybe yours, were full of you know, sort of self-laceration and, and misery over girlfriends and misery over this and they, they weren't the kind of journals you want for a book that's about where you were that like notice things you observe 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 and I actually went back to old friends who I traveled with and lived with in those days and asked if I could see their journals um, just to kind of jog my memory about what had happened and how we lived and and a, and a couple of good friends um, gave me heavily redacted journals <laughs> and um, and I figured it was all like mean stuff about me, um, that, but I don't know what was under there. Anyway, but they were really good, and they were like better journal keepers than I was. That helped a lot with, with what I ended up doing but, um, for this book, but it was only when I made a sort of turn to journalism, which my father had actually encouraged my whole life, um, but we were at cross purposes. I could never kind of get what he wanted me to do, and... Um, and and, and then when I, he, and he never sort of had an attitude of I told you so and um, when I started actually publishing and getting somewhere. Um, but he had a lot of it in mind all along. Um, so I, I was also sort of blessed in this regard. Um, but it's, it's, it's hard, I think it must be hard to tell your kid, go ahead, do this long shot thing um, where your chances of failure are excellent, um, and 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 without some talent, your chances of failure are, are pretty certain. Um, and so it's right. You, in fact, yesterday uh, at another talk, Bill did. He was talking about how, though you've had a great career as a journalist, it's getting harder to recommend it to, to young kids. Yeah, I mean, students um, ask me, you know, should I do journalism? And it's hard to say yes. I mean, it's a contracting industry. Um, there are fewer jobs, and, and, and it's, uh, going to journalism school is a, um, is a very risky investment. I mean, you may or may not be able to work in journalism when you're done. Well, should we take some questions? Yes. I think there are mics in the aisles. Right? There's one here and another here. Who's got a question? Uh, I guess this is a bit more of a comment than a question um, and a bit of an admiration, uh, Carissa, for you as a surfer and a, a competitor. But it was season before last. It was a few weeks after the, the final event at Honolulu. Um, I remember seeing on your Instagram you were in some amazing far-flung place, I think on a brand trip with a few people, Tavarua or somewhere like amazing. And um, 
as soon as you got back, I saw you the next week. You were surfing alone by yourself. It was windblown, nasty, diamond head, like one, two foot. And you were just out there by yourself, just kind of surfing uh, in the middle and in between. And I've been being really struck by that, uh, just seeing that someone who performs on such a high level and knowing the commitment and drive and just seeing you out there um, uh, passionate and, and surfing on your own, free surfing for fun in, in such you know, adverse conditions. Um, so just attesting back to the um, part about soul surfer versus mm -hmm. um, uh, competitor. I don't, that's not really much of a question, I know. But. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. And it's funny because that is soul surfing, but it's also that competitor in me that knows that my competitors are doing the exact same thing and they're working just as hard. And you have to put in the time, even when it's horrible and no one else is out, you have to do those things mm. that nobody is necessarily gonna see, but you have mm. to put that time in. So I think it's a bit of like, yes, I loved love it, but at the same time, I don't really love surfing bad stuff by myself. Mm -hmm. But I also <laughs> like, there's that like competitiveness behind it too, so. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. You know, we, the surfing public as it were, I mean, we think that top surfers are always surfing these great waves. They're, they're being, you know, you mentioned, um, I think the other day, you said that you'd surf Rincon last week, and, and it was a big swell in California. Rincon's this great wave in California. I said, how was it? Oh, it was too big. It was crowded. It was hard to get any waves. I saw that clip that you put up on Instagram of you at Rincon. It was incredible, and you were absolutely ripping. You know the, way, the wave I'm talking about. It's <laughs> insane. So you did all right at Rincon. And they're always being flown off. Oh, Rincon's going to be great. You're there, Chris. And that's how you think of them. But I, this other, having to get in the water every day to train, to stay in shape, to be, you know, um, you must serve all kinds of terrible, like you're the only person out. That hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> it, it's, it's um, well, it's crazy because, like, as good as waves we get on tour, yeah there's just as many days that are horrible. So you have to be prepared for everything and be willing to adapt. And um, you just have to find the enthusiasm in that kind of stuff. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to find it right now. <laughs> here we have a question over here. I went to, uh, I graduated from Punahou 50 years ago. And uh, when I was in eighth grade, uh, my science teacher was Fred Van Dyke. And on a good day uh, on the North Shore, he would call in sick. Um, <laughs> Peter Cole was also a science teacher in the academy, the same thing. Uh, classmate was uh, Fred Hemmings. And you know, the question I have is, is this still the framework that Punahou offers for surfers? <laughs> wait, wait, what? What was hey, the question exactly? It, the, <laughs> Sorry. That's about Chris the framework that Punahou team. offers yeah. for surfers. I, I think it's like teachers telling lies and skipping school. Is that <laughs> well, you know, on the East Coast, we get snow days, right? You get mm. 10 days a year off because it snowed. Here you get, you know. Surf days. Yeah. That was before climate change. It's two days now. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the ocean and surfing is just a part of everyone's lives. So you just got to cut us some, everyone some slack. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's even worse, though, than what I do. I desert my post and miss my deadlines, but I don't leave, like, 30 kids sitting <laughs> um, <laughs> wondering where I went with some, you know, lie from some doctor's note. That's really low. <laughs> I see a question here and a question over here. Oh, you got one here? Oh, oh. Um, this is for Carissa. Like, what was your first wave you ever stood up on? Like, what age were you? Um, I, you know, I don't really remember my first wave in detail, but I, my very first wave was around four or five years old, and it was in Waikiki Beach, um, at Queens, and with my dad, and I believe he pushed me in, and my mom was up at the end to catch me, so I didn't do much on the wave, I probably just stood up and went straight, but, um, I'm sure it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun, so, yeah, do you surf? Yeah. Yeah, do you like it? Mm -hmm. How long yeah. have you been surfing for? Um, like last year. So. Last year? That's awesome. I hope maybe we can surf sometime. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> On a really, really terrible day, you'll find her out. <laughs> Here's another one. Hi, Krista. Um, this question is, um, how has surfing lifestyle changed for women in competition? Uh, and opportunities from when you first started to now? Um, 
Yeah, uh, a lot has changed. It's been really exciting, especially over the past couple years. Um, you know, you've, we've definitely seen, you know, a raise in prize money. We've um, gotten better venues. Um, even, you know, I don't know if you guys know, but um, when we have joint events with the men, like we've always struggled to surf the better days because you know, they've always given the men the upper hand or the first choice, and now it's pretty even, you know? So that's really exciting. Um, and I also feel like over the past, especially the past couple years, um, I think the women are getting way more appreciated for that, their athleticism and the way that they're surfing on the waves. And it's awesome because when we do have a joint event, all the guys are coming down and watching us. So it's just really nice to be gaining that respect. And I think we're leaving the tour in a, and just surfing for women in a really great place for the next generation. And the men don't surf Honolulu. They don't, we get it all to our Yeah. <laughs> My yoga teacher has a question. Right, Mary? Uh, Carissa knows I'm a huge fan, and I, I remember seeing her as about a five or six year old out at Kaiser's with her dad slingshotting her in, and Robin Otagaki and I were out, uh, Don patrolling, we're paddling out, and I just saw the silhouette. She was kind of backlit, and I went, oh, look at that little boy, he's just shredding. <laughs> and then I got closer and I went, oh my God. Gosh, that's a little girl. And I was just so proud to be a girl. <laughs> like, yes. Uh, and in response to my cousin over there, um, there's one morning I had my hair wet. She had her hair wet. Robin was clearly had been wet. And Carissa comes up and says, Oh, was it teacher's morning out surfing? <laughs> she didn't say how we were ripping and stuff. <laughs> But actually, my question was for you, Bill. Um, as a journalist, and having just published a memoir, I'm kind of remembering, what was it, a million little pieces? Yeah. Right. And so I'm just wondering how much stretching you might have done in your memoir. Mm -hmm. I think zero. Um, I mean, the magazine where I work is, is sort of mad on fact-checking, and I've been there for 30 years, so you really get the habit of getting anything wrong drummed out of you. I mean, I'm not sure I got plenty of things wrong, but, but nothing intentionally. Then again, um, it's this wholly subjective story, your autobiography. And I actually tried to, I mean, it's a very weird genre for a reporter memoir, you know, because you end up kind of investigating your own life you know, sort of like reporting out your past. I can't just write it, I have to go make sure it's correct. And that involves talking to a lot of the people who are there, going back and interviewing old friends and comparing notes and frenemies and you know, all these people who were in one's life and remember things differently. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's, a, um, it's a strange, I don't know, arrogance not the word I want, but it's, I mean, giving yourself, this was private life, right? This is all off the record. And, and now you're giving yourself license to depict all these shared, unguarded moments. Um, that's a big arrogation. And, um, and you have to really think hard about what you're going to put in and, and how it's going to affect people. And so you leave out tons. And um, so it's not as if this story is the truth. Um, it's, it's more like a selection and, and a highly subjective. And there's a lot of, even a lot of negotiation about what goes in here. I got into one crazy negotiation with um, an old friend about a big moment, kind of a big moment in the book, but a huge moment in her life. And her memory of it was wrong, was incorrect. <laughs> um, I was sure of it. And she'd actually written about it a lot, like poems and stories, and it transformed the thing. Anyway, we went back and forth about it. I said, it's in the book, and I want to make sure I have it right, and I know you've written about it, and, we, and we, I thought we had it all, and she had it a little wrong, but okay. And then I got to know from her, oh, one more thing. You weren't there. <laughs> what? Uh, I mean, this whole thing's been about what happened, we were, this thing we did together. Yes, one more thing. You weren't there. And I just, oh, <laughs> you know, and there was just sort of nothing to be done, and I couldn't talk her out of that. Um, and so I said, well, how is it that I re remember all, well, it was another time you came along. 
Uh, not true, but I had to then, then decide how am I going to, it was kind of, as I say, it was kind of like the denouement of our long relationship. We were finding her long lost father is what happened and um, on Skid Row in San Francisco. And, um, and so I had to make the call and I said, you know what, this is a big moment in her life. It's her story. It's her father. Um, I will um, just kind of <coughs> fudge it so it won't be as dramatic as it really was when we found him. It'll be like I was there when she went to see him sort of thing. Um, but that was, so that was a kind of stretch, a reverse stretch, like just to, but otherwise, no, none of that. This, um, the reference, A Thousand Little Pieces, was a, a bogus memoir. There are lots of bogus memoirs out there, but this guy got caught kind of red-handed. He'd made up, do you remember this, James Frey, a few years ago, quite a scandal, and lots of people do that, and, and, and I, was, I was shocked actually in a class today, it wasn't from this book, but um, uh, a creative writing class was looking at a short piece of mine from the magazine, and, and kids were shy, so okay, write down your questions, and, and all these questions, is this a true story, is this a true story, is that everybody, of course it's a true story, it's journalism, this is fact, what do you mean, oh, okay, okay, you know, everybody kind of assumed I made it all up, did you have to do research, it, it was hard to come up with these characters, that's me, these are real people, and, I remember so. someone saying about the James Fry controversy mm. that uh, Americans were outraged that they had been tricked into reading a novel. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have some more questions? We've got about 15 minutes. Oh, uh, this is for you, Chris. Uh, um, I remember the first time you started surfing at Kiwalos, and I'm so happy and thrilled. And it was awesome to watch you take this journey and path, as they will say, to where you are sitting there right now. And by the way, do you remember who that guy was who told you go back to Waikiki? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't me, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it could have happened to a much better um, person than yourself. Uh -huh. I mean, whenever you come out, you always take time to talk to the kids and everyone. And I certainly remember the one time I told you I thought you were like a little jack in a box because you were going to fly in these airs and coming down. You reminded me of my kid, um, kid days. But anyway, my question for you was, <laughs> you know when you're free surfing and all, and you just kind of look for those double ups and have fun, and you know, you're soul surfing. Um, that barrel you had at Honolulu, when that wave, of course, um, you was in priority. When that wave was coming, because you were in competition, were you aiming for that barrel, or you were just trying to do your simultaneous thing as normal? Or did you know that thing was going to just double and be the barrel of your life? <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that wave was just incredible. I mean, thank you. that's off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, actually, so that last day unfolded, couldn't have unfolded more perfectly. Um, I actually had advanced to the quarterfinals the day before, and Courtney Conlog, who was the other girl in the title race, um, had a round four heat with Coco Ho. And, um, you know, my dad, Luke, and I, we just went back to the hotel. It just disappeared. We did not, I did not want to see that heat. I did not mm -hmm. want to watch that heat because if Courtney advanced, then, hey, like, business as usual. We both were in the game till the end. Um, but if she lost, like, that was the moment I was going to win the title. And so um, it was funny. We were back at the hotel. We were going to go down for a little bit. And then I, bing, I got a text message. Coco's got a nine. Where are you? Get down here. And I'm like, oh, gosh. So we rushed back down to the beach. And of course, um, that's how it all happened. Coco ended up winning. And Courtney lost. And I won the world title, which really took so much pressure off of me for the rest of the day. And you know, there's very rarely do I just get to let go completely in competition and just totally surf from my heart. And that day was so special because I got to. Um, the world title was finished. I got to you know, spend it with my family and my friends, and the waves were perfect. And it was really cool because before I paddled out for the, before the final, my dad's really good at predicting things. And he was like, someone's going to win this heat on a, in, in a barrel. Like, they're going to win on a barrel. So I was like, OK, I've got to look for that barrel. And um, it was crazy. I was just having the time of my life. I was like, I really didn't care if I won or, or lost. But I mean, of course, I wanted to win. But it was just, I was just having such a good time. And then. Um, I saw this wave coming in. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the wave dad was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I just saw it and I just felt it and I just went for it. And there was really, like I said, no thinking at that point. It was just mm -hmm. believing and letting it flow. So yeah, it was, if, it's just like surfing, surfing Kualos. <laughs> Coco asked you to take her out to dinner? <laughs> Wait. Coco said, you owe me dinner, huh? <laughs> I know, I, I still got to take her out to dinner. I actually bought her a really nice pair of earrings the other day. <laughs> so I'm going to give it to her when I see her. <laughs> 
that wave, or, or rather that heat, that final, uh, uh, which I recommend people check out, really, I was going to mention earlier, and everybody was aware of this, you'd, you'd already won, so you could just surf as loosely as you wanted. And of course, you surfed even better. And it was that example of like surfing for the love of it was so clear in that, in that final. And that barrel, that's that outside barrel, right? That right off the takeoff, almost like standing up, the full, deep, long, outside barrel, really um, an inspired move to Thank pull in out there. It was pretty funny because I, <laughs> I ended up cheering for myself on the way out. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I was so stoked. I just yeah. could not wipe the smile off my face. I, after that, I was like, I didn't even think it was a 10 or anything. I was just, mm. just so stoked. I was, mm. It was cool. Yeah. You want to claim that one now? No, no, no. <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> Um, this question's for Carissa. Um, what advice do you have for us for surfing? Oh, awesome. <laughs> um, I think my biggest thing would be um, don't be afraid to fail. Like, that's just a part of the journey, and you learn the most from your mistakes. So it, it can definitely, you're going to have your frustrating days, and you're going to get angry, and you're going to want to give up. I wanted to give up multiple times, but... After you cry it out, you're just like, okay, I got to get back up and figure out what I got to do better. And um, yeah, the journey is not going to be easy, but in the end, it's going to be a lot of fun and, and really worth it. And, and share it with people you love. Like, that's the best part. Like, looking back at my journey, like, you know, this, the moments of success are few and far between, but it's the moments that you get to share with the people that you love that make it all worthwhile. So just enjoy it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Three and one. <laughs> I uh, wanted to thank each of you in uh, unique ways. First of all, uh, Bill, because when I was in writing school, I'd, uh, in grad school for uh, an MFA, I had been surfing my whole life and wanted to be a writer, but I never thought about writing about the two uh, together. And the piece you did on Doc Rineker came out in The New Yorker, and every surfer I knew was handing out Xerox copies. I said, have you read this? This is unbelievable. And it was the first time that taken a really literary approach, and that in, ended up bringing me to Hawaii to teach here at Punahou and meet such amazing people like Fred Van Dyke and Peter, Van Co you know, Peter Cole. And so I, uh, I appreciate that, and Chris, I appreciate you bringing the, the stoke back to professional surfing and just the joy and sheer love uh, of the sport. And my question is kind of like that uh, because at the time, you know, uh, most writing was kind of written by surfers for surfers and seemingly on a surfboard, and uh, it didn't aspire to, you know, super high levels. Uh, what, what could you say about surfing and writing, the similarities? Um, how do they kind of come together for each of you? Well, it's a hard thing to write about for a general audience. It's got all this, I mean, the, the act itself and, and, and any kind of detail. And, and unless you get into the detail, you're not, I mean, the generalities are boring. The details are interesting. But to understand them, you need to sort of back up and give people almost a glossary, you know, so that, that the language isn't opaque and, and you can begin to understand what those details are. So there's this whole trick of gently educating people as you're working up a narrative that, that will, will grab them. So it's, it's um, uh, and you have to think, what have I got in front of what? And um, I, uh, like this book, um, my wife who has zero interest in surfing, kindly read draft after draft and she'd say, oh, what, what, what's a channel? You didn't tell me what a channel is. I say, how? I mean, that's not even a surfing term. A channel, a ship channel, please, you know. Just, it's, it's just, well, there are no waves, please. And she'd say, nope, I don't know what a channel is. You have to tell me. And, uh, um, those, those New Yorker pieces were plagued with that because I had copy editors doing the same thing to me. And, um, and I really had to, I felt, kind of dumb it down for our readers. And, and, and when I went to adapt that, story to a chapter in this book, um, that was actually the hardest chapter to write. Um, although it was already written, like 40,000 words, fact-checked, legally vetted, edited, you name it. 
it wouldn't go into this book. It was an incredible, uh, I, and I could take out all that introductory stuff and all the corny stuff that my editors made me put in, who's Gidget and all this stuff, out, out, out. Um, and all the magazine profile of stuff of Mark Reniker, out, out, out. Um, but still, I couldn't get it, it didn't, it didn't feel right. Um, and, but that's, that's the main thing about writing, surfing for a general audience, is just somehow, and not disgrace yourself among surfers, you know, um, by being um, kind of um, silly and, and sounding like you're uh, you know, a bad grammar school teacher. I'm, I'm sure there are no bad grammar school teachers here. Um, in, in, in being simplistic. So it's, it's a trick, you know, to kind of get people up to speed and feel like you're not patronizing them and, and actually not be patronizing them, but get them to the point where they're comfortable with the language and can picture what you, you're talking about. I don't know if you ever try to write for non-surfers, but, but, but and within the tribe, it's a whole different, another language. I mean, when we were, we met the day we started talking, I thought, if we talk like this in public, they're going to like walk out. Um, I'm saying, so are you using that other rock? Are you taking off behind it? You know, it gets really boring for everybody. <laughs> Yeah. Who doesn't serve? Or... Um, yeah, I don't really think about it too much. I just kind of write, and whoever reads it sort of understands or doesn't understand it. I just kind of... Do you it, think it's mostly surfers who follow you and, and read your stuff? It's probably just my mom and Auntie Lori and my grandma who reads it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I don't really know who, who reads my blog, blog or follows me, and I just kind of put it out there for whoever wants to read it. You seem it. to write freely in, in surf lingo, if that's appropriate, mm -hmm. and, not, and not deep you know, lingo that's obnoxious. But, um, and, uh, and then you'll write about a subject that's, that's more universal, you know, body image or something. You'll actually just write about it, and obviously anybody can come in from any direction and, and know what you're talking about. Yeah. I think we might have time for one more really quick one. Who has the best question in the room? <laughs> OK. Great. Is it me? OK. So my question also is for Bill, relates to the New Yorker article over here. And uh, the link to the book. I was just curious, you know, um, you wrote in the book, it was hard for you to come out with that New Yorker article, part of, you know, because you were wondering what, you know, Mark Reniker, your surf buddy at the time, would think about it, and you sort of exposed the community a little bit. So I was curious, you know, um, a lot of time passed between that and the book, you know, did you get sort of a reaction from the community? Did that influence what you put in the book? And uh, what was that like for you, personally? Uh, um, yeah, that piece, which was written in 1992, you know, a couple years ago, um, uh, did get a big reaction um, from the community. I, there's a little group of surfers in San Francisco. There's Mark Reniker himself. There's a larger surf community. It just got a lot of reaction generally. And it, it, I, that piece took me seven years to write. Um, I missed a few deadlines in there. And, um, uh, and one of the, I, I mentioned being kind of nervous this is in those days about coming out of the closet as a surfer because of the sort of political writing I was doing for a living, and, and I was also quite inhibited by a worry about his reaction to the piece. I started thinking, cause it was kind of about a small community. When I proposed it, it was a profile. There was just like a few surfers in San Francisco at the time. And once I started, I got the assignment, once I started reporting, um, I sort of discovered that, this, that, that he was not a universally loved figure in this community. Um, that he was quite a controversial figure, and, and people sort of split in, about him. And, and I thought, hey, you know, I can't tell the truth of this place and this guy and this time and this, this story um, without at least suggesting you know, some of this hostility and resentment. And, and I went very, very light on it, but I just knew he was going to hate it, and indeed he hated it. Um, so um, there was his reaction, and then it was kind of rings and rings around that, and, and uh, it was it was horrible and it was difficult with him, and um, but less so. And there was a sort of surf press, um, and and they were kind of uh, cold and then warm, and then it it didn't really matter too much. Um, but that piece did have a long life in Xerox, and um, <laughs> and to this day, I uh, this day, yeah, even recently, I was in Baja not long ago. It was surfing with, talking to some guy on the water, and he started telling me about that piece. And I said, oh, you know, 
I wrote that. And he said, no way. And he just, pad <laughs> he just paddled away from me. I, I, uh, liar down the line, a liar the next week. <laughs> so. Well, I hate to do this, but I reckon it's time to shut it down, isn't it? How did your mirror neurons do? Are you, are you better surfers and writers now? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can we give our two luminaries? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.